Welcome to the Academy Podcast, a podcast dedicated to sharing rich content for the purpose of spiritual growth. I'm your host, Claire McKeever Burgett, and I serve as the Associate Director of the Academy for Spiritual Formation, an international ministry of the Upper Room. The Academy creates transformative space for people to connect with God, self, others, and creation for the sake of the world. This month's podcast is the second in a series of conversations with Parker Palmer, released in both audio and visual formats. In June 2018, Academy Director Johnny Sears visited with Parker in the Palmer home in Madison, Wisconsin, and we were lucky enough to get to film it. Parker and Johnny talked about everything from vulnerability, to what makes a good leader, to how to sustain the work of the Academy for the next 35 years. What follows is an offering from their conversation on safe space, good news, and belovedness in a world that tends to distort all three. When Parker and Johnny talk about safe space, it is important to note that they're really talking about transformative space or trustworthy space or even brave space. They do not mean safe as in protected from risk. Rather, they mean safe as in no harm done. Safe space for Parker and Johnny is about creating places where the soul's deepest imperatives are discovered and then finding the courage and community to act on them. We share the following conversation then in hopes that their mutual dialogue about life, love, politics, work, passion, leadership, and spirituality might enrich your own lives and the conversations that comprise them. Listen and watch on, beloveds, and enjoy. Here we are, it's 35 years later, uh, since the beginning of the Academy in 1983. And um, many of the things we've talked about uh, that were going on in the world in the 60s and 70s are in new incarnations now. The world is still, um, it's a time of tumult, disease, um, and uh, so to me, I mean, there's a role for things like the Academy um, in a world like this. Uh, it's still very relevant. One of the ways that we um, articulate what we're doing, why the Academy exists, is to create uh, transformative environments or safe mm-hmm. space mm-hmm. for people to be in communion with themselves, with God, with others, and with creation mm-hmm. for the sake of the world. It's mm-hmm. that inner and outer mm-hmm thing right there um you know so what is the role in your mind of um and the importance and value of creating these places where people can can be in communion with themselves god others their soul yeah creation um in times like these yeah Uh, yeah well as you know johnny i i am while i've not been intimately involved with the academy or its programs i've had my own 25 year run at creating circles of trust that I wrote about in a book called A Hidden Wholeness, (laughs) which also, where we also use the phrase safe space. So the first thing, my first response to your question, and I hadn't, I knew the question would be coming, but I hadn't anticipated this response, (laughs) is if you think for, you know, 10 seconds about the phrase safe space, mm-hmm. what does it imply about the other spaces in our world? <laughs> right. Well, that they're unsafe yeah. and that we need to provide something that the world isn't providing. And if, if you know, if, if, if there's anyone alive in our country today who doesn't understand uh, how unsafe most social spaces are, then they just haven't been paying attention. Right. Or, or they're emotionally or intellectually dead because most Americans will say, I don't dare express my true political opinions, for example, even to members of my own family. Everything goes up in flames mm-hmm. when I do. And I don't dare speak to my neighbor who's of the other party or of some other persuasion politically, or my neighbor will never speak to me again. And when, when the world is full of unsafe spaces, a terrible, terrible thing happens. People never have an opportunity to hear themselves or others speak 
from the soul's deepest imperatives. Mm. I mean, ultimately, my political opinions, if I, if, I, if, I, if I dig deep into what it is that I believe, are not political opinions. They're only political opinions eventually. Yeah. But ultimately, deep down, they're rooted in fundamental convictions. They're rooted in fundamental beliefs. And even more so, they're rooted in these mysterious movements of the soul or movements of the Holy Spirit that um, rise up, bubble up, percolate up in my life and lead me either to say, depending on how open I am to them, don't build any walls anywhere. Right. Um, cross all lines that you can and do it with courage and good cheer and bring the good news to everyone and, and not just by saying it but by being it. Um, yeah. You know, Tertullian, the, the church historian, told, has told the story in, in his writing of how people were attracted to the early church before the church became politicized yeah. in the fourth century. And it was a very simple story. In this era of the early church, when just being a stranger made you eligible to be killed because tribalism ran so deep in that culture, right. the early church gathered strangers together around a belief that overcame their fear of each other, around a living spirit. And strangers who were, were not yet members of the church, according to Tertullian, would look in on this and say, I'm quoting Tertullian now, see how they love one another. See how they love one another. See how they be love to one another. It wasn't, man, was that a great sermon. You know, or, <laughs> right. wow, do I lo like the comfortable pews. Yeah. <laughs> or, fantastic recreational program for kids. <laughs> they said, see how they love one another. And I think that these conversations um, are where we start to reclaim th those sort of fundamental truths about how things work in God's world, um, which is often a different world than the world of organized religion. But we need organizations. I mean, I, institutions, organizations Some are matter. the vessels that carry the treasure over time, right? right? Our problem is that we forget the biblical admonition that we have this treasure in earthen vessels to show that the power belongs to God and not to us. Yeah. And that means that every word, if you take that seriously, by my lights, that means that every word in our creeds or theological formulations is, or, is an earthen vessel. Every bit of our church structure, hierarchy, allocations of power, is an earthen vessel. And if we want to keep the treasure alive and loose it unto the world, we need to be willing to break the earthen vessel yes. to, 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 to let that power flow yeah. in us and through us. And, and not to imagine that we belong to a church simply because we're sitting in the pew and we're pledging. <laughs> that, that's right. a pretty thin definition yeah. of what it means to belong to the body of Christ. If you listen to Tertullian, what it means to belong to the body of Christ is to love everyone without reservation, including especially, perhaps, the people you're most afraid of. There's example after example of why we need spaces that are safe for the soul. Spaces where it's safe for me to listen to the, my soul's deepest imperatives and and then to to find the courage in community to act on them yeah. i have a sort of reverse definition of spiritual formation i do not think of it as a tradition putting the cookie cutter on people mm. and saying this is the shape you ought to take no. i think of spiritual formation as a process that rescues the soul from its deformations which have happened in all these unsafe spaces mm -hmm. in the world and so spiritual formation is letting people assume their God-given shape
Right. I really believe that we're all made in the image of God. Right. Um, and and I don't believe in original sin. I, I don't believe that God creates us distorted. Right. And, and you know, I, I, I believe that what we're called to do is to put ourselves right. in relationships and circumstances and solitudes that allow the soul to regain its God-given form. Safe spaces for the soul are the key to that. Because as long as people are moving in and out of unsafe spaces all the time, nothing like that is going to happen. And, and here's the nub, the nub of the problem when it comes to churches. And this is just a simple empirical fact. You ask people, at least in my experience, how likely are you to reveal the deepest struggles and pains and sense of failure in your life within your congregation? And the answer almost always is not very likely. Right. Because I'm going to get judged. I'm going to get, they're going to try Directed. to save me by dragooning me into something that I'm not ready for. Um, they're going to shame me. They're, they're going to marginalize me. You know, there are millions of people who would say, I'd rather talk to a bartender, or I'd rather talk to a stranger on the train. It's safer than to bring it to church. We have to change that dance. Yeah. We absolutely have to change that dance. Churches need to teach people how to bear witness. How to be in conflict. Yeah, how to be right? in conflict. How to be in healthy conflict. Yeah, absolutely. And, and how to do, uh, healthy conflict means bring it home. Yep. Don't keep it out there at ideological arm's length. Right. You know, don't say, well, I subscribe to a political belief system right. that doesn't allow that for that kind of statement. No. no. What you just said is hurtful to me personally because yeah. my son is gay. Right. Or my daughter is married to a black man. Yeah. Um, we it puts a human face on whatever it is. It puts a doing. human face on it. That's... See how they love dehumanization one is yeah. what drives so much of it. Absolutely, uh, yeah. If we can, yeah. Douglas Steer, I think, used the phrase "hardening of the categories." Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, yeah. You know, so I imagine that's kind of what he meant, right? Is we we have these ways of right kind of right uh, putting things in their boxes and yeah. and having these these clearly defined lines yeah. that yeah. keep everything apart and keep it keep us from recognizing the human. Yeah. Yeah. humans yeah. that um, are really uh, at the root of whatever this is about. Precisely. And I, I think probably he also meant um, hardening of the theological categories well, I, so that, you know, if, if your conception of God or your creed about God doesn't line up perfectly with mine, I'm sorry, you're not of my tribe right. and I can't talk to you. We need to have some recognition, and this goes back to earth and vessels, that words like God are, and soul are words that point to that for which no one has the true name. The mystery. The mystery. And we need to respect that mystery and find ways to walk around it and wonder at it and be inspired by it and not get hung up on the fact that you talk about it differently than I do. You know, there are some people who think, well, what could be more appealing than a call to love? That's a very dangerous call. Yes, yeah. You want to issue it with any seriousness, any force, any edge, any point, be careful, be ready. I guess not be careful, but be ready. Be ready, right. And because you're going to get significant pushback. And if you're not getting significant pushback, I think it means you're fudging the message. <laughs> I, you know, right, I really I, do. And I, and I think that the work of, of spiritual formation is in, is in that sense some of the most important work we have to do in this society to increase the numbers of people who are willing to take, who are willing to risk for love. You know, Dorothy Day, one of my great uh, heroes in the movement, was very fond of quoting Dostoevsky, who said, love in action is a fierce and dreadful thing compared to love in dreams. And I, I, she, was, she knew what she was talking yeah. about because she spent her she life did. living with the poor 
you know, there are certain people like her and Dietrich Bonhoeffer who have total credibility for me. If they say it, it's got to be true. I feel that way about Howard Thurman. I feel yeah. that, you know, I feel that way about Elie Wiesel and so forth. If you live it and you can come out saying these things, then guys like me ought to pay attention. And, the, you know, one of the big issues in the churches is that there's a lot of organized religious life, not just in the Christian churches, but everywhere, right. that's built on the safety of conventionality. Yeah. And, you know, while, while ministers aren't, aren't ordinarily crucified, they're often fired right. or marginalized right. or undermined by, by people in the pews who don't like um, the countercultural message. Uh, because it, they find it threatening. I mean, they joined the church to, for the sake of looking good in their communities, and now suddenly they're not looking good because their preacher is saying things that are very, very countercultural. Yeah. Now, I, I happen to think... It challenges the status quo. It challenges the status quo. I happen to think that part of the task of spiritual formation has to do with diagnosis. Like, what, what, where are these people coming from, the ones I, who resist the countercultural message of the gospel. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't think they're coming from evil. I think they're coming from fear. Right. I think they're coming from fear. Fear is driving a lot of American right. politics today, and that's nothing new. It's right. always it's been we, there from the beginning. We all know that today, you know, in in 2040, 2050, this country is going to be over 50 percent people of color. Right. That that's something the founders could never have envisioned. And frankly, a lot of them wouldn't have wanted. Um, so, so there's there's this fear of diversity, among other things, this fear of justice, this fear of love for everyone, this this fear that it's actually true that everyone is a child of God. Right. Is that, you know, everyone like, has like intrinsic I can, value. Like I can hold that belief as long as it's not true of everyone. Because right. there's some people I just don't like, and I'm sure God doesn't like them, right. too. You know, so we, I, fear I, of the other. It's fear of the other. So it's not it's not you know ingrained evil. It's not original sin. Right. It's it, but it needs to be diagnosed for what it is in order that you can treat it, treat that fear. And there are ways to treat the fear of otherness. And one of the simplest is meat people as face to face as human beings in some sort of generative context where you realize oh the other doesn't have horns because another part of the great yearning that i think spiritual formation has to speak to is that we all every human being yearns to feel at home in his or her own skin and at home on the face of the earth well you cannot get there if you're running scared of people who don't look like you, right. who don't have the same skin as you, or talk like you, or, talk like you, or believe like you, right. you can't get there. And so a big piece of spiritual formation, I think, is helping people r realize that their deepest yearnings um, w have not only inner life answers, but communal answers. and. And the inner life can then help us, help animate us, help us find the courage, help us find the vision to engage the larger community at, while at the moment it's a scary place. We don't want to go there. But I think spiritual formation, rightly understood, can help us get there. When the conversation between Parker and Johnny was taped and recorded, I had the honor of sitting and listening behind the scenes, playing the director role. So, when Parker said, the work of spiritual formation is some of the most important work we have to do in this society in order to increase the numbers of people who are willing to risk for love, I remember having to hold back an audible amen, welling up from my gut. 
And I didn't have to hold back the amen because I am the associate director of the Academy for Spiritual Formation and, oh my gosh, what a great soundbite that would be for our marketing campaign. No, the amen that rose from my core was one of resonance and belief, deep trust and formidable faith in the spiritual formation journey that always calls us to love in action. Sometimes that love in action takes us to the poles. Sometimes that love in action leads us to deeper healing for ourselves. Love in action always beckons us to serve, love, protect, hold, and stand with the other. Parker's words were resonant then and they are resonant now because at their core they are an invitation into befriending our fear so that it no longer takes the lead. In its place, love shows up and says, follow me. With one foot in front of the other, may we find the courage in community to follow wherever love leads. Parker Palmer is the founder and senior partner emeritus of the Center for Courage and Renewal, and a world-renowned writer, speaker, and activist who focuses on issues in education, community, leadership, spirituality, and social change. He has reached millions worldwide through his nine books, including Let Your Life Speak, The Courage to Teach, The Hidden Wholeness, and Healing the Heart of Democracy. To hear more from faculty and wisdom guides like Parker Palmer, join us at the next five-day or two-year academy. And to learn more from Parker and Johnny's conversation, tune in for the final audio-visual episode in December. For all of this and more, visit academy.upperroom.org.